Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the Basketball Ireland Performance uh, Conference uh, brought to us in association with Pinergy. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Kira Losty and Mark McGettrick, who are going to talk to us about all things sports psychology and basketball. Um, so thanks to you both for joining us. Um, just briefly to introduce Kira and Martin. So Kira is the course leader um, and lecturer in the Masters in Sport and Exercise Psychology in Waterford Institute of Technology. Um, so Kira comes to us with a lot of experience. She's worked uh, with Olympians in the past, being part of the sports science and medical team um, who went to London 2020. And in a row, Kira was providing sports psychology support for athletes in the um, holding in the holding camp. Uh, currently, Kira is working with numerous Olympic athletes in the preparation for Tokyo 2021, um, and also works with uh, G or senior GA teams. So we look forward to hearing uh, some insights from Kira. Um, we also are joined by Martin McGettrick. Martin is obviously well known around basketball circles. Martin is currently the head coach um, for the Basketball Ireland Academy uh, girls under 14 and under 15. Uh, Martin has also completed the FIBA Europe cer coaching certificate um, and is also a National League referee um, and has refereed at the highest level in, in both men's and women's Super League. Um, so I think I've introduced, I haven't forgotten anything about Martin, but you can no, be there if I'm wrong. Um, so, yeah, I suppose, thank you both for taking the time to join us and, you know, to give us input into this conference. We're really excited about it. Um, so I suppose to kick off, Kira, for anyone who's tuned in who doesn't know, can you tell us what is sports psychology and why is it important? It's just really simply sports psychology is about helping athletes and players perform consistently and to the best of their ability and perform under pressure. But can also help and aid athletes to thoroughly enjoy their sport and the, the performance process overall. It really is just one piece of the puzzle or the jigsaw and one of the sports sciences that any athlete or player can really avail of. In that the players might get to understand uh, why they're performing and how they're performing and if they need to change anything up in any way to help them perform better. Okay, great. Um, and Martin, we know that you worked with Kira in the past uh, in, with the international team programme. So can you tell us how you benefited from working with Kira um, and how that helped your preparation for Europeans? Um, so when Kira and I worked together, it was my first international programme. And uh, to say that it was a, a shock to the system, uh, you realise how quickly you're out of your depth and so you, you had lots of elements, as Kira says, piece of the, the, the jigsaw and part of the puzzle. So basketball was one part with sports psych, which I think a lot of coaches have an interest in and a lot of coaches have some knowledge. But you realize that when you go to the, the European Championships or the high performance team, that how little you may or may not know. And Kira's support was crucial in us getting through the preparation program, which was one element. But actually the tournament in Bulgaria which brought a lot of different pressures for the you know, under 16 men at the time and for myself and the coaching staff. And I think just simple coping and resilience and being uh, self-reflective was, was a big part of it. And there's a lot of pressure on young players, young men and women at that point coming from different elements. And I think that, you know, wins and losses can be a, an obvious reason, thing that people look at, but when you when you go deeper with sports psych you see that there are other elements that you can judge success on as well and that was a huge thing for me at the time because it was my first uh, proper experience working with someone okay and you kind of touched on it there martin so in your role as a coach how did sports psychology help you outside of how it helped the players uh coping skills coping with all the the external drama and pressure that was going on um I remember back to that time that some of the boys were coming from an environment where they were used to winning the whole time, where they were the best player on the team. And when they came into the national team program, that maybe they weren't seeing themselves with the same success, whether in terms of scoring or winning. And they didn't always cope with it. And there was other issues going on in the background that you become aware of when you spend that amount of time with, with the team. And 
my I suppose strategy was to talk it out and listen or talk back and, and tell them and, and in, in, engage with them but that's not always the best solution and certainly no working with Kira there was times she pulled me aside and said just let him vent or let him externalize it whatever mm-hmm. that there can't always be a solution and that um, just let them get on with it and different things like that or what not to say more importantly because we are a nation of talkers and maybe we like to talk it out sometimes just just be quiet and listen so mm-hmm. certainly from my point of view um that was that was eye-opening and there was a lot of learning there for me okay great um and i suppose Kerry, going into that environment uh some of the players may or may not have had um been exposed to sports psychology or been aware of mental skills training so when in your opinion should sports psychology become part of the conversation um, I think that's one thing probably, Martin, that we got really, we got well, uh, or we got right really well in that um, it, sports psychology wasn't an, ad- an add-on. I was really embedded into the programme. Mm. I was there with the players at, at training. They knew me. Um, I don't think we've even really used the word psychology or sports psychology. It was much more performance approach than life skill approach. Um, so I was just part of the whole team. It, it wasn't something extra or um, if something is broke, you need to talk to the person who's going to fix it. So there, there wasn't that approach to it all. And that's probably something to consider really for, for youth interventions about when it should really become part of the conversation. And that a lot of the work is actually done at that age with the coach and with the parents as well um, to really so they can really understand maybe their own communication skills and to what a supportive parent actually looks like. And also from a, a, um, a pedagogical perspective, a skill acquisition and how people learn best as well. So a lot of these things are done with the coach and parents, not necessarily with the players, but you're around and you're there. Even though it might not actually be called sports psych, it can be u- useful for just tools for life really and yeah. coping skills and resilience. And that they're actually probably better placed as players and athletes later in life because they've been introduced to so many skills, the language to better deal with like pressure, expectations, and just that kind of high performance environment as well if they, if they make it at that particular level. And also the other piece really to consider really is their overall well-being mm-hmm. and their mental health and how we actually can impact and support them as well. And that's a really critical piece, particularly at the moment of real contemporary mm-hmm. topic as well. And Kerry, you kind of touched on it there where, when you mentioned the importance of parents and the role that they play. Is there anything, say, as, an, as Basketball Ireland or as academies that we should be doing to support parents in their role? Yeah, it's, I suppose it's one, one thing really, I suppose, for parents is that they should parent and the coach should coach. Okay. And that the parent is the child's biggest uh, cheerleader. Mm-hmm. And that no matter what, they're, they're a parent first and they're a supporting role and um, second but to really I suppose I think we did this well at uh, Martin and that we you know we used the parents we actually got them involved and we um, d- delivered psychoeducational programs to them we had we brought them to the workshops and um, this is the days before zoom all that kind of stuff but they were involved they were yeah. they were part of the program and if somebody yeah. was enthusiastic and we get them a job basically yeah. so we yeah. really involved them in things as opposed to uh, and use their motivation and enthusiasm in a way that was um, positive as opposed to kind of taken away from the, the program. Yeah. And Martin, just on that, in terms of the academy uh, structure, how intertwined or how integrated is sports psychology in the program? It's it's a part of it. Um, so pre-COVID, when we had the, the camp at Easter at Bormestown, so we brought in some sports psychologists. Um, so four of the people that I've worked with, one is a former student here is John Byrne. So he's, he's been uh, working with us a lot and he's very, very good because he has a sporting background. But we had former basketball players in Neve Callahan and Siobhan Crown come in and talk to players and Colin Murphy as well. And they were excellent. And we were talking to 14 year olds and 15 year olds. And it was very simple. It was nothing too heavy. It was just a little bit on goal setting, which wasn't just saying I want to play for the Irish team because that's why they want to be in the academy, but how to get there as well mm. and what they would have to do. We did a little bit on, on coping skills and we did a lot on, on teamwork. So we ex- okay. went through this and, you know, any resources that we had, we sent home. So parents knew what we were doing. Um, and we had obviously some, some of the 
boys and girls are a little bit further along in emotional development and they were able to buy into it and others it was brand new it was the first time and you know that was we want to kind of embed this in in the culture that there is support there that's part of the process it's nothing complicated it's nothing uh, difficult it's just something simple that maybe they don't come from backgrounds where families have lots of sport and and this is stuff that that they that they learn and we want to give them a starting point with that but it was quite good and um, having former basketball players or former sports people or current basketball players come in and talk I think gave the especially when from the girls side that it was another role model it was another person who had been through mm. it there was experiences from their own playing time that I thought was quite useful and beneficial to the girls so we do that um, as part of the program and we provide resources then to our academy coaches that they can use as well you know so we really want to create in the academy a a team ethic you know that they feel part of something and you know there's positive sports psychology and communication that that's needs to be done constantly mm. but. perfect and um, so i suppose we've kind of touched on it but is feedback still largely missing um from psych- psychology discussion um outside the highest elite levels so yeah. like uh, post competition event reflection that kind of thing yeah, it's probably something, um, it depends on the sport and it depends on the coach and it depends on, I suppose, how you plan. Um, for me, it's probably just based on who you work with and how they actually organise their sessions, mm. their feedback, but it's a hugely essential part. And having worked in basketball, it was probably something, again, it's one of the sports that does actually reflect and particularly when you're in a championship environment and you have to go out and play a game in 24, 48 hours, you have to sit down irrespective of the result, mm. whether you win or whether you lose, whether you want, to, you want to talk about it or you want to paper over the cracks, even if you win, there's still things you can improve on. Reflection, evaluation, and just tweaking and changes are, are all part of um, the process. In some other sports, it, it doesn't happen as regularly. Mm. Um, but again, it, it does, it's probably a little bit more coach dependent for me. That's from, just from my applied yeah. experience. Yeah. And Martin, just in terms of your experience, what do you think? Um, I suppose starting off, I, 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 and I still see it when we do the, give the courses and people come back to us that they always want to talk after the game. Um, and, and I know for me being slightly emotive that that's not a good time for me to talk uh, after a game. But I, I, we see people talking a lot to the players, mm. you know, and obviously with timeouts and halftime, you see lots of communication and there is constant feedback. I think we have a lot of coaches who are giving on the, like they're, they're, they're like joystick coaches. They're giving that constant feedback straight away, which doesn't allow the players to process. But after games, you see it. And I think, you know, a lot of coaches now and, and you see a generation of coaches come through who are very good at constructive feedback and having it more concise and succinct. And I, I suppose that when I started coaching 25 years ago, that that wasn't something that was hammered home that was important in the process. And that, you know, it was X's and O's and drills and stuff and games. And it was only when, you know, I broadened my, my, my coaching experience that I realized that there was more to it. And I see coaches coming through, we see the coaches come into the academy who their starting point is far better in terms of giving feedback on the slide. They're moving around, they're not stopping everything, which I would be very much guilty of. And then after games, you see them very calm, whether it's win or loss, that it's good balanced feedback. Mm. Um, and I think that's that's an area that we constantly need to keep developing and through coaching Ireland, Sport Ireland, Dave, I remember when we were doing our course and stuff that they wanted more of that. Mm. And that was kind of an issue that at the time, maybe we wanted more basketball and they were saying, well, this is the soft skills that are far more important that as coaches, we need to be able to help the players with. Okay, great. And just in terms of the feedback and the different ways we get feedback, how is technology impacting on sports psychology? I think um, everything for me, for now, in a fly perspective, I never would have worked online at all. It would have been one-to-one, and there's a whole even rules and regulations now about how to actually work um, online now. Um, but video replay, those types of things are really mm-hmm. important now in that they aid even visualization, that players can watch back clips of themselves, even basic, basic um, teams that are, aren't in a high performance setting have access to that type of information before. Mm-hmm. I suppose the higher up you go, the more complex it can be in that you can have eye tracking, 
you can do days, you can actually see where players are track their, their their eyes and see where they are looking and where yeah. they need to look and, and things like that. Yeah. And um, and virtual reality actually has a huge part to play and it's coming to the fore a little bit more now with COVID. In that you can't maybe train or play together, but can you put on equipment now and actually um, use virtual reality games to actually simulate actually being at, at something. But even basic performance analysis now, instead of just like your your rebounds, your your passes, that type of stuff, you can actually code now for psychological things. You might look for body language, head position, all those types of things. So you can add that into the performance analysis that it's not just all um, you know, stats, 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 stats. Yeah. Like Okay. Um, and Martin, this might be one for you. Are coaches at all levels more open to external involvement now? I think every coach, or sorry, I think a lot of coaches would love it. Um, I spoke to some today when I was, when I was planning for this and they, they would love to have somebody help them and observe them and observe their interactions. Mm. Um, but obviously there's a cost issue and there's an availability issue. Um, and then there's also a, a time issue of what makes them more efficient. But like, you would take someone like Alan Keane, who you know, who's currently very successful in England. You know, he has his timeouts videoed. So there, there's there's mm-hmm. simple ways of getting this. Like, because we might not be aware of certain words we say an awful lot or messages. Like, so as as a teacher, you know, I would have a lot of observations, and we would have our classes videoed and stuff, so you can look back. Alan wears a GoPro in some games so that he can see, look back at what he's been looking at and how he reacts. And that might be a step too far for people, but coaches are very open to it. Um, and again, it's it's just become part of the process. It's nothing, um, you know, oh, you had someone in talking to you, you had someone in looking at you. No, it's just part of, of what we do. Because peop- I think coaches now have become far more um, self-reflective and want to find how to connect better with their players and, and be more efficient with their, their time and, do better for them so I think certainly it is something that might have been a massive issue uh, and, and a past generation that god you had someone in but now it's it's kind of I won't say run of the mill um but it's certainly that it's a bit like team teaching in school here a lot of the kids are used to there being two teachers in the classroom I think lots of teams and coaches are used to having that person come in observe them and give them feedback and help them Perfect. And Kira, from your perspective as an external person going into a team environment in general, are you welcomed? What sort of experience have you had, say, within, you know, when you started out, say, to where we are now? Yeah, it's different. And each sport is very, very different because each sport has their own culture. And, yeah. and each coach that has a, a different philosophy and a way they actually uh, approach things. But for me, the coach really is the key is to coach even if they don't even really understand everything you're doing but they're open to it and they're open to their feedback themselves they really are the crucial gatekeeper to you know promoting it positively with the players and as an add-on sports science but that's what I think it really is for me it just fits with nutrition strength and conditioning uh, physiotherapy you know if you have a sore back you go and you see your physiotherapist if you want to talk over something, go see to go talk to the psychologist. And it doesn't like actually have to be a mental health issue. It can be a performance issue as well. Yeah. Or maybe you need to change something up, or maybe you keep making the same mistake over and over again. So how could you approach it maybe a different way? So it's, it's simple things, but it does really depend on the, the, the sport and the coach and the culture of that of that team as well. I do find it different as that again then between males and females sometimes females generally are a little bit more open to it and males are, are not but that's really reflective sort of a microcosm of society that is reflective of mainstream society that's mm. women are generally more open to um, talking to somebody and males are a little bit more close but that's shifting and changing because the conversation around those things are shifting and changing too. And I think there's a broader understanding as well that it's like that it's you work on your nutrition, you work on your mental skills, that it's all going to benefit you in the long run. Yeah. Um, so I suppose just a few things that you both touched on earlier on was around resilience. Um, so I suppose before we get into that, can you just explain what is resilience for anyone who, do, who doesn't know and why is it important? I suppose resilience is a big keyword at the moment and uh, it's something that I'm being bombarded with for people, by people to actually talk about at, at the moment but in really simply it's just the ability for a person to withstand pressure and 
And, and sometimes we overly focus on the individual to withstand the actual pressure and don't think about the environment that we put them in that actually can actually develop somebody's resilience over time. So it's, there's a bit of a, there's a shift really in the research away from seeing it as a fixed trait and that you have it or you don't have it, that you can work and you can develop it. So the environment really in basketball that we need to construct is really putting challenges and bumps on the road for our actual players so that they can overcome situations, develop new skills, but also so challenge, but also high support as opposed to a challenging environment with absolutely no support as well. Mm. So that's kind of somewhere sometimes where the sports psychology can come into play. So it's like maybe asking someone they need to, you know, increase their strength and condition or decrease their body fat percentage. We don't give them any support yeah. in that area. Yeah. Okay. You would never dream of doing that. Okay. So it's the same really from a mental skills perspective. So developing challenges and helping them over, overcome setbacks, but giving them space and time to work it out for themselves and support them through those actual challenges that you actually set for them. So bumps on the road are good because you develop resilience over time. Perfect. And I suppose with the academy structure and with internationals and players looking to go abroad or whatever may be, make their national league team, um, a player, everyone in life, players and everyone will experience setbacks um, and they may have already experienced it or they may experience it in the future. So what advice would you give those people um, on how they can handle handle that? Yeah, and my setbacks and failing, there's a big difference between failing and being a failure. Mm. There's a massive, massive difference, okay? And that being a failure is a full stop, but failing is is learning and growth, first attempt and learning. It's, I know it sounds a little bit simplistic, mm. but it genuinely is. We even say lift to failure in strength condition. And if you're lifting to failure, it means you're actually mm. pushing your body in some way. So you should be making mistakes. You should be pushing the boundaries out. And that's really important. But when the player is making those mistakes or experiencing setbacks, we also should, should facilitate the welfare. So it seems like I'm saying, if the challenge is high, we should have expectations that the player can actually meet those challenges and still accountability and responsibility in them but also really help them promote learning and support them in that learning when they actually are are failing but failure is part of the process you're supposed to fail along the way mm. if you even think about covid and vaccines many times if they fail when well, they're actually making the vaccine but every time they fail and every time they make a new vaccine they learn more yeah, yeah. and you don't want them to give up no <laughs> no <laughs> same process from a mental skills perspective yeah learning and failing provides huge learning if you reflect on it. resilience doesn't just naturally happen because you've had something awful happen to you so it's minor trauma not major trauma is what i'm talking about setbacks yeah. okay small setbacks not create absolute trauma for people either just to put a disclaimer on that one if someone says yeah. Kira said, <laughs> her with somebody and bring dragging them through the army boot camp. Yeah. You have to knock them down to bring them back up. Yeah. Well, bumps on the road are good. Definitely. And Martin, say from a coaching perspective there, so we've touched on players and resilience, but obviously, you know, with coaching roles, there is a certain element of pressure, whatever level it may be. So as a coach, how would you deal with setbacks, whether, you know, it's having to uh you know the performance of your team or personally so how, how would you deal with that well if you were to ask me now i'm, I'm i've got an awful lot better processing things when it comes to the game uh, and and shutting it down and saying i have to move on whereas maybe 10 15 years ago i'd i'd have brought i'd have overthought it and brought it with me and it had always been an issue and it would have affected other things and you know you mentioned i referee would have been why I couldn't have refereed 15 years ago because if I had a bad game and there was conflict in the game, I wouldn't have dealt with it well. So as I've got a little bit uh, more mature and, and more basketball experience, more life experience, I'm good at processing, working out what I was in control of, what my players were in control of, you know, how we measure ourselves in those things. And, you know, we do a lot of well-being and, and coping uh, skills in school, like, and, you know, it, it is about learning from the scenarios and situations that you put yourself in. And I learned very quickly after I came out of National League that wins and losses weren't everything. Um, when I was in it, I, I probably didn't see that very well. But mm. um, it showed me that that wasn't the area that I was good at coaching at and, and having to deal with that. 
Um, and I, that I didn't want to have kind of people going when you, you know, you finish bottom in the league. I wanted to help people develop, help players develop. So that took a change in how I, how I looked at the game and stuff. And yeah. I see, again, you know, we're, we're learn from the, like the next generation is always a little bit better. So I think that you see now coaches who are sharing their information. There's a, it's easier to access this kind of help and support. And, you know, there's more conversations taking place. And even from basketball arms, but the amount of Zoom uh, webinars and supports that they've done in the last six months means that coaches are hearing and sharing more information to help. And I know from my point of view that if I had this help a long time ago, I'd have been a happier coach. I might have been, mm. I might have been ended up being a better coach as well. Um, but that there, there wasn't that support maybe in the background that I, like I got the Irish job because I was supposed to have been a good coach, but I didn't know anything about sports like or nutrition or really I knew a tiny bits. And I think that sometimes that's very dangerous. And um, you know, you can get someone fit but not fit for the game of basketball. I think if you start doing sports psych, you can end up causing damage because you think you know what you're talking about and that's why it's good now that there's more access and I certainly see coaches are, are reaching out more for more knowledge in that area. And you think uh, Martin you touched on it there as well so you said that maybe National League wasn't where you're meant to be or you know so it's important I suppose to say that not all coaches need to strive to be a National League coach that there's a niche there for everyone. Well, I think if we if we were able to reward in some way, um, whether it be through social media or awards or whatever, that the coaches, the grassroots coaches are doing mm. a great job. I suppose that we have 10 national teams and a lot of people aspire to there and that's, that's success, but it's not the only form of success. Mm. That there are lots of coaches and really good coaches around the country who are coaching under 10s and 12s and who give a love of the game and who help develop good life skills. Mm. And they do it in a, such a good way that they're giving them the tools to move on to the next level forever. And, and not just in basketball and, and sport. And I do think that that is something that in basketball, we've gotten off that better at, yeah. that we we can reach out to these coaches. I, I know when on the post video that we did a lot of grassroots clinics and there's lots of good people out there who are doing a great job. And we do need to find some way of recognizing them and encouraging them and telling them how good a job they're doing because they're there. Um, mm. And while they might think I need to know more basketball, I think they're teaching them other skills mm. that, that are coming through. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Uh, you see a lot of good work in schools as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So that's great. Um, so I think the burning question, I think, for everyone listening will be return to sport. Um, so obviously we're all dying to get back on the court um, and sports been on our sports been on hold since March. So we've had various uh, skills videos and so on and be uh, the basketball on YouTube channel, as you mentioned there, Martin, and also covered stuff like strength and condition with Kevin Foley and Peter Madsen. But in the context of COVID, how important is sports psychology and mental skills training in the return to play program for our players? I think it's a really it's a it's a really complex one because COVID hasn't touched everybody equally. Um, mm. some people will actually thrive in these uh, environments. Um, some people it's actually completely traumatic being in this type of environment. And most of us are probably somewhere in the middle where we're just feeling that heightened level and sense of anxiety. And even though we're planning to come back, there still is uncertainty around things and um I was saying this in class earlier, and certainty is like fertilizer for anxiety. Even if you're not an anxious person, you will probably feel more anxious at, at this particular time. So simple kind of cognitive behavioral therapies that focus on, focusing on what you can control is very important. So how you think, how you feel, and how and your actions, and reminding yourself that you can cope with the rest and recognizing that you do have a choice in what you think and what you feel as well. But I also think it's important to acknowledge that others mightn't have coped with things the same way as you have. Mm -hmm. And as a coach, that's really important as well. And perception is reality. It's going to be different for everybody. So for the coach, maybe you're going to have to really encourage maybe some to seek out support. Again, COVID will have touched households and families differently. And um, encourage them to get support, encourage them to talk to each other and talk to professional is necessary as well and um, and really i suppose put mental health and well-being to the forefront 
as opposed to performance. Let's get back first and everybody well and healthy. Let's move it and then start to focus on the on performance. Now, that's not to say people can't, in COVID time, reach smaller incremental goals, but it's, you can't compare it this year to what you did last year on your team or with players. It's not, it's not for compare. So the goals, the goals are different. Everything has to be flexible and every, everything has to be adjustable. But just from a general wellness perspective, I think mental health needs to be put at the fore for, for basketball Ireland and for their players. Great. And Martin, is there any strategies or, you know, um, programs in place currently in the academy in terms of, you know, still trying to interact with players and keep that, keep that going? Uh, we haven't had much in- interaction. Um, we've been communicating with the parents, and it's been the parents have been so supportive, not seeing what we're trying to do. And I just want to echo what Claire is doing. Like I, you know, on social media, you see a lot of our our current players, Isaac Westbrook, Hillary Nets, um, players like that who are doing workouts, and you see all the engagement that they're getting. Mm. And you see that there's a lot of young people out there who who want to keep practicing, who want to keep in in in. In, in touch with the game and that's not available to everybody that's out there so when when we get back to playing hopefully sooner rather than later that we we understand that everybody's going to be somewhere on a scale that mm. you know that they may not have had much access to, to sport or fitness you know and that everybody's trying to be positive and that others have done lots and have, have moved on and that let's get back and, and enjoy what we're, we're supposed to do and I know that you know, that enjoyment might be winning games at national league at any level because you know children are so competitive they'll want to play but they may have lost something in the six months and so not mm-hmm. to be thinking about what happened last year and saying well last year i could do this we, we, we're not starting new but we've had this kind of roadblock in our way that's affected lots of things um, and some that we'll never know about as coaches because we'll have family situations and different things mm-hmm. but i think as coaches we have to be very supportive we'll have to be patient which not necessarily a skill that might come easy. We'll get back into games and our competitive juices will come flying out and we're playing the local rivals. But, you know, for, for the next little while, it's just good we're back on the court. We're back mm. being a team. We're back being part of something. We're giving, we're doing what we enjoy doing, what we love doing. And if we're coaching youth sport, we're giving children and young people the opportunity to express themselves mm. and have fun. And we're, you know... It won't be exactly as, as we thought it might be or if it, all things been equal, but we'll get through it and we'll move on from there. And I think that's, you see a lot of teams are helping their, their players with, with Zoom sessions and stuff. And you can mm. see the positivity that's coming out of that. But that's not for everybody. It's not possible in different mm. places. So I, my, I suppose positivity would be the big thing I would have when we get back on the court. Be grateful for what we have. Great to see that who's there and support them as we move forward to the next one. And no giving out to me. <laughs> Especially you, Louise. Especially you. Um, no, that's great. And an important thing you both touched on there was like mental health and support and that. So just to, to mention for anyone who is listening that we have a partnership with Jigsaw um, and Aware and I. So they're, they're youth mental health services. So if there is anyone who needs to reach out, you know, please use that service. Uh, we put it in place so it's there for people yeah. uh, to get that support. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that's great. So I suppose the, the kind of second last question um, is the indiv- indiv- individual versus team needs. And you kind of touched on it there. Um, but I suppose I'll specifically talk about the kind of more elite teams, people who are preparing for Europeans next summer. So how does a coach and support staff overcome the challenge of the individ- individual versus team needs when they're preparing for a European competition? I think it's, it's still, even though it's a team sport, you still have to have that individualized approach, no matter what, everybody, and that's probably one of the myths about sports psychology and that it's the big motivational talk or it's the, you know, the something's going to happen, with, you know, before the big game, like, my job is to make myself redundant, that if I'm there or not there, the players know what to do, mm. they know how to get ready mentally, they know where they sit on an energy activation scale and how to get into that into that performance zone. So even though it is a team sport, they're going to have, you know, those players still need to individually know how to, to plan, prepare and respond to what's going, in, going on in the actual game situation. So that's probably the unique piece is how you develop 
that therapeutic alliance with the, 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 the client that you're working with and, and individualize the program for them. But by them meeting their individualized goals, you're feeding into the bigger team goals as well. So it's not that it's it's part of the jigsaw, it's part of mm. um, the bigger puzzle. So there isn't a yellow pack version, there isn't a one size. <laughs> it has to be individualized. And that's where embedding sports psychology into particularly high performance programs is incredibly important. That you gain the trust of the players that you're working with and that happens over time. And then when you actually know them well, you get to know their triggers of stress or anxiety, and then you can develop specific coping skills for them. And the more skills and tools they have in their toolbox, so no matter what situation they're in, they know what to do and they know yeah. what tools to put out for that person. So it's about developing their automatic responses, really. Yeah. Um, okay, and final question to you both. Uh, you can decide who goes first. <laughs> um, so what do you think we'll be doing in five years' time that we're not currently doing in basketball? Go on, Martin. Uh, <laughs> well, with all, with all the changes that FIBA keep making uh, to the rules and stuff, they're, they're, they're making the game faster and more dynamic and way more of a spectator sport. And I think they come out with rules that you know, who comes up with this has a, has a great imagination to see how things will change. I, I, would, I would not like to see the game keep to change the way it is so that the grassroots and, and youth sport becomes detached from it because we're obviously, when they make rule changes, it's for the professional levels, the, it's mm -hmm. the highest level possible. And, you know, things with shot clocks and all that, that doesn't need to affect youth sport as such. So I'd, I'd like that, you know, they keep developing the game to keep up with, with um development of, of of athletes and all that but that it doesn't just become a spectator sport that it, you know, it is a great sport for inclusion it is a great sport obviously we have the different levels and um, but what they could come up with next week i have no idea because you know when the rule changes come out every year like it's like you're going really um sometimes you know it's just another set of rules to learn um, and as some of the players might say i need to learn them more but you know, the game keeps evolving because we as we as individuals and culture and society keep evolving, but it's getting faster. And we love that, like as a sport in Ireland, we love that go, go, go element of it. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, will they come back from that at some point? Because, you know, it, it's a sport that all can play like. So mm. I don't have an answer to that. I'm hoping Kira, I'm hoping Kira does. So firmly on the fence. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Um, I suppose I'm going to come at it from more sports side for as opposed to basketball perspective, mm. but there's a massive gap in uh, female research in all sports really, and that all of the research, most I think it's like 90 something percent is really male and um, male dominated, and that we need more female specific research on whatever topic it is, but we're talking about female high performance athletes and female participation athletes, and mm. um, so I think that's there's a bit of a shift and change culturally about uh, developing research in that particular area and um, much more gender specific and then also much more sport specific research so psychological strategy specifically for basketball or measurement tools specifically for basketball or mm. hurling or whatever it is so the movement away from general psychology to much more sport specific and then gender specific as well is um, is definitely a trend in the, in the future and I, Louise, sorry, Louise, can I add to that just that from a basketball iron point of view, that whatever structures we need to do to have more of our, our really good female coaches to get involved, mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to talk myself mm -hmm. out of a job, but to have a, a have a, a high performance uh, coach slash administrator in my role as a role model, and there are some great of uh, current players and past players out there that we'd love mm -hmm. to have involved in the academy structure and ask ourselves as a in GB, are we doing enough? to help them and is the structures we're using mili um, mitigating against that it's male dominated um, in coaching mm -hmm. um, at, at performance level because mm -hmm. they're there in schools and clubs so that's something for us that in five years time I'd like to see um, so that's a bit of a better answer than my previous one but that is something um, yeah. that we need to look at and do better and that's not that's across all sports maybe but certainly our own I, I can think of lots of people who could do my job as well. And why why can't we have them in those roles? That's yeah. that's a question we have to ask and answer. Perfect. And I know I said that was the last question, but Kira, you did touch on virtual reality earlier on. And I'm wondering, is that going to be part of our future post-COVID? Hopefully. I think <laughs> the cost of technology changes so much and so quickly. And, it, you know, what 
the elite of, are doing today would be what we're doing mainstream in five in five years. You, you see that happening all of the time. The athletes might be able to get to Tokyo now, but they can look through <laughs> to actually see what the stadium that, 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 that aren't built yet that they're going to be in and certain things. But yeah, what is what is elite will become mainstream in, in, in yeah. five, ten years, absolutely. Great, we'll get you on for that in a, in a few years' time. You can talk to us all things virtual reality. Okay, great. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, that was a nice way to wrap it up. Um, for everyone else, thanks for tuning into the session. There's a range of other discussions as part of the Basketball Ireland Performance Conference, so stay tuned to our social channels, um, and there's lots more for you there. Again, thanks a million for sharing your thoughts, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, Louise. Bye -bye. Thanks, Kara. Bye. I'll just...